Greetings, friends, and welcome to the podcast of Jewish Ideas, a Torah in Motion podcast. The Haskalah, or the Jewish Enlightenment, was one of the most important intellectual and cultural movements of modern Jewish history. Beginning in Western Europe during the 18th century, enlightened Jewish intellectuals, or maskilim, began to discuss, write, and campaign towards reforming both their own native Jewish society as well as the place of Jews within their wider society. Today we will be exploring the nature of the Haskalah as well as its effect upon other movements afterwards. With us to discuss the Haskalah is Dr. Micha Gottlieb, who is the Director of Graduate Studies and Associate Professor of Jewish Thought and Philosophy at New York University. He is a noted authority on the Haskalah with many books and articles to his name, including his most recent prize-winning book, The Jewish Reformation, Bible Translation, and Middle-Class German Judaism as a Spiritual Enterprise, published by Oxford in 2021 and recently out in paperback. It is a pleasure to host this distinguished authority on the Haskalah with us at the Podcast of Jewish Ideas. Professor Gottlieb, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Excellent. Uh, so let's dive in. Um, so we have before us the phenomenon that we call the Haskalah. Um, I would like to try and get a bit of a handle on, on this idea, on this notion. Um, so what were, would you say, the major characteristics of the Haskalah? Uh, what, what characterized a maskil? What would he or she be interested in doing? Okay. So let's begin with the question of what the Haskalah is. And I think the easiest way to start is to start with the chronology and the geography of it. Um, so scholars generally see the Haskalah, the, the Haskalah movement as beginning in the 18th century, in mid-18th century, in Berlin. Um, and it began with figures uh, and individuals who coalesced around um, the figure of Moses Mendelssohn. So to really understand what the Haskalah is in its origin, um, and you know, to answer the other questions that you've that you've been raising, I think we really need to go into Moses Mendelssohn and understand his biography, his story, and what he stood for. So Mendelssohn was, you know, born in 1729, and he was born in a rural German town called Dessau, uh, and he was educated in the traditional Ashkenazic method. So what that meant was that he studied Talmud almost exclusively from a young age. He learned Yiddish was his mother tongue, um, and he was taught no vernacular languages. So he, has, he had a very distinguished teacher and rabbi whose name was David Frankel. Uh, Frank, David Frankel is known today um, you know, among people who know, as the author of the Korban Ha'eda commentary on the Yerushalmi. Um, and when Mendelssohn was 14 years old, his teacher was appointed the chief rabbi of Berlin. So he left the small rural town of Dessau, and he went to Berlin, and Moses Mendelssohn followed him there. So Berlin at that time was this really center of culture and enlightenment. Uh, it was a very vibrant place. They had people. They had all sorts of different people there. There were. It wasn't just German speak German speakers. There were. There was a lot of French influence in Berlin. There were Calvinists. There were Dutch. There were all sorts of different people with different religious orientations, different nationalities, and different languages. And the Jews in Berlin, unlike in many other places, didn't live in a ghetto. They weren't segregated from the rest of the population. So Mendelssohn, as he, he already had these kind of, you know, somewhat philosophical interests earlier, already, it seems when he was in, in Dessau, um, he studied, um, you know, Bible very carefully, which wasn't, you know, a very, you know, the most uh, common thing. And he also began to study um, the guy that perplexed. But when he came to, um, when he came to Berlin, he became introduced, introduced, we don't know how, to various individuals that scholars call proto-masculine. And these were individuals who studied at university. They were traditional Jews. They were observant Jews, but they studied at university. And they cultivated knowledge of Jewish philosophy as well. Um, so Mendelssohn studied, studied with them. 
uh, or came, came, became acquainted with them and was influenced by them. And what he began to realize is that um, there was this whole flourishing culture, this whole enlightenment culture that was, uh, that was happening and that he wanted to gain, gain acquaintance with. So he realized that the first thing he needs to do was to study languages. So the first thing he needs to do was to know German because he didn't know German. He only knew Yiddish. Um, obviously, he could read Hebrew um, and Aramaic, but Yiddish was, uh, you know, was, was, was the language that, that he spoke. So the first thing he did was he taught himself German. Um, then he taught himself other languages that he felt he needed to engage the culture of the time. So he taught himself Latin. He taught himself Greek. He taught himself French. He taught himself English. All right? And through these languages, he began to study philosophy and especially Enlightenment philosophy. So, again, continuing with Mendelssohn's story, he, there was this one individual who he became close with whose name was Solomon Gumpertz. And Gumpertz um, had this friend, he knew this kind of younger, younger colleague named Gotthold Lessing. Uh, Lessing was uh, the son of a pastor. He had um, the, a very extensive secular education, philosophical training. He knew he was taught you know, many, many languages, Greek, Latin, all these languages in school. Um, and somehow, according to the legend, they were introduced over a game of chess and uh, they became best friends. And Lessing was destined to become a revered figure of the German Enlightenment. He wasn't a Jew, correct? He was not Jewish, right? His father was a pastor. He was not Jewish. He was a Christian. And he was, um, you know, destined to become this leading figure of the German Enlightenment, and they became lifelong friends. So they began together um, discussing works of um, philosophy, and they, just, they started producing, writing philosophy together, discussing philosophy. They started, they put together a, a journal of literary criticism, right? So... You already can see one element of the Haskalah, which is a certain kind of cosmopolitanism, right? A certain kind of engagement with ideas outside the Jewish sphere, and a, you know, a willingness to have friendships with uh, people who aren't Jewish, while at the same time maintaining one's uh, one's Jewishness, which Mendelssohn did his whole life. So Mendelssohn kind of started his career, you know, working on these kind of questions of universal significance, you know, you know, these kind of questions of philosophy, metaphysics, but also, very interestingly, art and aesthetics. He was writing, uh, as I mentioned, literary criticism and also theories of, um, of, of aesthetic theories. At the same time, in this early period of Mendelssohn's, he also sought to bring some of these ideas to his Jewish peers. So he edited this uh, journal, we could say, or this, um, you know, it only four issues appeared, but the journal was written in Hebrew. Right, and this was called Kohelet Musar, and this aimed to bring a certain kind of enlightened sensibility to his fellow Jews, and that's a second characteristic I think that we could talk about uh, when we mentioned the Maskilim was that they had this great respect and reverence for the study of Hebrew. They thought it should be studied grammatically. They thought it's important that Jews know Hebrew. Um, so that you know was you know clearly part of his of his project. Um, now, Mendelssohn, again, he's kind of started off with this kind of very idealistic perspective that, oh, you know, Jews and Christians will get along and we can unite on these kind of questions of universal ethics and universal morality. But he had a very rude awake awakening um, in 1769 when he was challenged by this um, Christian, this uh, Calvinist Christian, evangelical Christian, Johann Kasper Lafater, to either refute Christianity or convert. And this was the first time Mendelssohn in German had to talk about his Judaism and to defend his Judaism. And he wrote this uh, very famous, masterful open letter to Lefater, where he defined Judaism as a religion that was much more in consonance with Enlightenment ideals than Christianity. Because previously, Christians thought, well, Christianity is a universal religion. Christianity is a religion um, of freedom. Um, and Mendelssohn showed that, no, actually, Judaism is much more in line with those ideas than Christianity. Right? Christianity is actually quite a parochial religion because 
Christians claim if you don't believe to G Jesus, you go to hell. Uh, Judaism has this notion of the seven Noachide laws, which Mendelssohn identified with laws of universal morality, right? Which he says, uh, according to the rabbis, one could go to heaven, one could attain salvation just by following these principles of morality. So, so again, we see already again an important dimension of Muscillic ideas, which is a kind of connection between Judaism and principles of um, universal morality, freedom, um, and also tolerance, right? The Enlightenment, one of the great calling cards of the Enlightenment was that it was embracing kind of tolerance, and Christianity was seen to be a much more tolerant religion. Judaism was a very intolerant religion. Jews, of course, had killed Jesus, right? I mean, what could be more intolerant than that, all right? But Mendelssohn is saying, no, actually, Judaism is a much more tolerant religion than, than Christianity. Um, but at the same time, Mendelssohn, of course, uh, he affirmed that halakha, this kind of distinguishing mark of Judaism, which Christians, again, thought this was a relic of, you know, this, you know, old parochial religion of the Old Testament, right? Mendelssohn affirmed this is um, fully binding. But what Mendelssohn sought to show, and this occurred especially later in his 1783 Jerusalem, which is his most famous work, that Halacha, on the one hand, he said halacha was fully binding uh, because God revealed it, and one couldn't decide, well, this is the purpose of halacha, and therefore if it doesn't, um, if, 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 it's, if, 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 we, if we can fulfill that purpose, another reason it's no longer binding. No, we can only offer hypotheses about the purposes of halacha, but he offered one hypothesis, and he said that the purpose of halacha was to take these kind of universal ideas about God, about morality, and bring them into one's life, right? Because there's a very famous problem in philosophy in that a lot of the literature of, in Jewish literature, especially Musar literature, is dealt with, which is how do we get from our head to our heart? We may know all sorts of things, but that doesn't mean that we actually live according to them. It doesn't mean that we actually embody them. Um, that's a real problem. I heard someone once said, you know, the, the, the greatest distance in the world is the one foot between your head and your heart. Right? <laughs> and so Mendelssohn was saying that his argument was that this is what halacha does. It allows one to live these universal truths of uh, religion and morality. And it's important to, to do so as a separate community. And Judaism provides this a model of this kind of ideal community for humanity, living these universal ideas, these ideas of morality and of Jewish religion that often get, have gotten lost in modernity, especially with the Enlightenment. There's growing atheism. Mendelssohn was very concerned about the growing atheism, uh, the growing intolerance that he saw, uh, the growing, you know, hatred, right? At this time, Enlightenment was no panacea for Jews. Enlightenment, there in the Enlightenment, often in many countries, Jews, of course, had suffered terrible disabilities in the medieval period, but in the modern period with Enlightenment, often those disabilities became worse, right? And Mendelssohn was saying, well, you know, this is just wrong. So this kind of connects to another element of the Haskalah, which is an attempt to ameliorate Jewish civil rights, right? To fight for Jewish civil rights, to take a public stance on this. And Mendelssohn did this multiple times, right? And for Mendelssohn, tolerance was a kind of basic demand of morality, but he also thought it was needed for Judaism to be actualized at the highest level because Mendelssohn believed that a religious act is only truly a religious act if it's done freely, out of conviction, All right? And so he thought you need um, equal rights for that because Jews have to have the option to either follow or not follow. They can't be under the coercion of the rabbis. Interesting. So I was going to say, I mean, you've touched on many points there, which I want to get to. But briefly before I do, I mean, you've very uh, adeptly and cleverly sort of um, exposed various major points of the Haskalah through the biography and the actions and the, and the writings of Mendelssohn. Um, in your mind, was Mendelssohn the centerpiece of, of the German Haskalah in the late uh, 18th century? Or, or was he, you know, uh, a, was he a figurehead? Was he a major leader? Was he... Um, you know, without Mendelssohn, could there have been the Haskalah that we know today? Or do we say, no, he was merely an example of of a larger movement that was anyway going to have this significant effect within the European jury? Right. So that's a, you know... I, it's, it's, it's unanswerable, really. I know. I'm, I'm sorry. He was clearly, 
extremely important. Now, he some scholars have said he was more just a kind of figurehead. He wasn't really a kind of activist in um, in creating a movement of Haskalah. You know, and there's a very you know famous article by Shmuel Feiner, who's a great scholar, who says um, you know he talks about this kind of myth about Mendelssohn, and that he says the real founder of the Haskalah was one of his um, you know was one of his disciples. So, but but I think there's a you know there is kind of truth to that that there were people who were activists who were really kind of creating um, creating the movement, right? But at the same time, Mendelssohn was. Did also he was also an activist. He wasn't just a, a kind of an ivory tower thinker. He different Jewish communities would come to him when they would have problems, when they would have different restrictions put on them, and he would argue for them, advocate for them, intervene for them. Um, he was involved with. He wasn't the prime mover behind, but he was in the, involved in creating the first Masculine school, right, which was would disseminate a Jewish ideas, the Freischule. Um, in uh, in Berlin, and Mendelssohn, um, yeah. So he, you know, he 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 took this active role in politics. Uh, he was involved, active role in, in the Jewish community. So he was both a kind of revered figure, but I think he also, you know, played played an active role. So interesting. Uh, you, you've described the Haskalah here, or rather, sorry, in my introduction, I described it this way, uh, and you picked up on it. Um, uh, the Haskalah, and really just defining it as the Jewish Enlightenment, which uh, is the title of, of Shmuel Feiner's book on the subject, and that's generally how it's uh, it's defined and how it's uh, portrayed. Uh, but I want to just ask, to what extent is this accurate? Because of course, we all know about the European Enlightenment. This, uh, you know. Uh, extraordinary movements within 17th, 18th century Europe. Um, and so I'd like to ask, you know, to what extent were these masculine, to what extent did they see themselves as part of this movement? To what extent did they think they were part of a European-wide movement? Or did they think of themselves much more as doing something more specifically Jewish, specifically within Jewish society? Um, how did they see themselves and how can we view them in this case? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. There's actually, there's really two components of it. One is... How did they see themselves? And, and then the second question is, how do scholars see them? And those are kind of two different elements. Now, you mentioned Shmuel Feiner's book, great book. Everyone should read this. You know, The Jewish Enlightenment in English is originally published in Hebrew. And the title wasn't Ahaskala. The title was Haneorot. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, because, you know, the argument has been made that Enlightenment is connected to the root of light. Haskalah is connected to Seichel, which is knowledge. So it's been argued um, that Haskalah um, should not, that translating Haskalah as Jewish Enlightenment is a mistranslation. But I'm not fully convinced by that. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> and I'll explain why. Um, so where the term maskil come from? Well, it comes from a verse in Daniel, in the book of Daniel. Right? It says, Hamaskilim yazhiru kezoar harakia. A famous verse, right? 12.3. So already we see that in that verse, you see a connection between maskilim and yazhiru. The maskilim will be radiant, like the bright expanse of sky. So there is a connection between haskalah and light in the biblical context. Um, and in addition to that, you know, obviously in a central component of enlightenment was um, this emphasis on knowledge, philosophy, perfecting one's knowledge, perfecting one's um, philosophical understanding of the world, scientific understanding of the world. That wasn't some incidental element. That seemed to be a defining element of, um, of the European enlightenment. So, you know, for that reason, I I'm not so concerned about um, whether the word masculine ha in the self has the root, the root of light um, as a problem for translating Haskalah as Jewish Enlightenment. But let's say a little bit more about this, because the argument isn't just about an homology, right? Some scholars have argued that um, you see something different in the Haskalah than in the Enlightenment. According to this story, Enlightenment was really about philosophy and science. and But Haskalah, and it was about universalism, right? But Haskalah stressed um, art and aesthetics 
that's a very important poetry. This is a very important element of Haskalah. It also exp- emphasized Jewish difference, Jewish nationality, Jewish even Jewish nationalism. Um, Mendelssohn certainly spoke of that, right? So the argument is that this emphasis on the aesthetic and the emphasis on national nationalism and difference is really a hallmark of Romanticism. So that it's been argued that Haskalah should be translated as Jewish Romanticism, which is kind of very provocative. But again, I think that's a bit kind of problematic uh, because you have to understand there's different enlightenments. And in Germany, the German enlightenment, in the German enlightenment, art and aesthetics are actually very important, right? And for, and, and, and for instance, for Mendelssohn, he defends what scholars have called a kind of rationalist aesthetics. So he seeks to link rationalism and the aesthetic dimension of things. Right. So so he doesn't see. So whereas for the romantics, often, you, you, at least the way it's commonly perceived, there's a kind of opposition between feeling and reason, between the aesthetic sensibility and the rational sensibility. For Mendelssohn, they're fused. Right. And and for other German Enlightenment figures. Um, and also, you know, you it's the same thing with his nationalism. Right. There's always a universal dimension to his nationalism. Right, the nationalism is in the particular, as it's often said, is in service of the universal. So I don't think that the this the, the fact that there are these two elements um, in Mendelssohn's uh, and in in Maskelic thinking um, that you know that don't conform to often our stereotypes about Enlightenment. But if you actually look at the German Enlightenment, these these features are actually quite at home with it. So I think for for on that basis, it's right to ident- to translate. Uh, Haskalah as Jewish Enlightenment, but also, and perhaps this is the most important, this gets back to your question, the beginning of your question, is that they saw themselves, the Maskelim and Mendelssohn saw themselves as members of the German Enlightenment, the Aufklärung, right? So Mendelssohn was widely seen in his day as one of the chief defenders of the German Enlightenment. Um, That's the way, it was his own self-perception, and that was the perception of his contemporaries. So I think to, again, to kind of translate for that, again, for that reason, to translate Haskalah as Jewish, as Jewish Romanticism is not the way the masculine would have seen themselves at all. Right. They were very s- suspicious of these kind of opponents of enlightenment. Not to mention that the Romantic movement gained strength, really, in the early 19th century after Mendelssohn and after the major figures of the, of the Jew, Jewish uh, Berlin Enlightenment. Um, that, that's neither here nor there. Um, so there are various uh, other aspects I want to ask you about. One of them is an interesting, um, I would say, tension or a duality that you mentioned before uh, when you read an uh, Enlightenment, specifically masculine texts, which is that some of them are pointed inwards and some of them are pointed outwards. In other words, a good portion of masculic writing is in service of reforming the Jewish community. The Jewish community must be more enlightened, it must have better education, it must you know, read the Tanakh more, you know, have a better Hebrew education, etc., etc., um, you know, be more useful, more productive. And on the other hand, there was the part of the, the Haskalah that faced outwards, attempting to convince, uh, let's say, the broader Germanic public, um, Germany didn't exist as a country, but the broader, uh, um, let's say, European public, the Jews were... I don't know, salvageable, the Jews, you know, could be included uh, in as modern citizens. Um, could you perhaps speak to that? I mean, have I characterized it correctly? Is, is there this kind of, are, are these two intention? Are these two uh, two different, fundamentally different pursuits within one Haskalah? How, how can one say this? Yeah, I, I see these as really going together. Right. Um, and, you know, there is this argument that, you know, that was made by certain kind of, um, economic writers yeah. in uh, German lands, so-called physiocratic writers uh, who argued that, well, the Jews are involved in trade. Um, they're not really producing anything. They're not making anything. They're just kind of moving money and goods around. And therefore, they don't really have value to the state. And Mendelssohn does address that. But I don't think that his primary intention in, um, in fact, he addresses that in, in his writings to the kind of German audience. I don't think his argument, in, if you talk about that internal reform that you mentioned, I don't think that's focused on really making Jews more useful. In fact, Mendelssohn's argument to those critics is, no, you need traders. Traders are very useful. He didn't agree with them. Oh, Jews should all become farmers. No, he said that trade 
And, you know, a so-called mini- middleman is very important for the economy, right? When you, um, you know, lend money on credit to people or, you know, you know, take interest, well, that's also a way of allowing them to invest in things. And so, you know, you know, I think today that should be obvious. I mean, to most people, it's not the banks are useless. <laughs> <laughs> these things are very important to the economy, right? So he actually had in some ways a much more sophisticated economic perspective. But I think the way in which these two things really go together, the inner and the outer, is that there's a, there's a kind of, you know, I think in some ways a kind of deep connection between them. And that is that I think the way I understand it, this internal reform of Judaism isn't primarily about looking good for the goyim and just you know putting on you know some lipstick or you know and making ourselves look good to, to use an interesting metaphor what? yes <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that but i think what the, the the argument is really about is about self development in other words what mendelssohn believed and this was a kind of certain foundational belief that he shared with certain predecessors like Sajid Gaon, um, you could argue like the Rambam, was that the purpose, even in some ways of Moshe, uh, the Ramchal, Moshe Chaim Lutzato, was that the purpose of Judaism was happiness. Was, now, happiness doesn't mean, a, it's not a subjective feeling of pleasure. It's self-development. It involves a certain kind of self-cultivation. Right. Um, and what does that cultivation have? Again, it's today we often think of, well, we, when we think of happiness, we think of it's always oh, very subjective. You know, one person likes chocolate cake, one person likes vanilla, one person, you know, likes, you know, reading books, one person likes sitting around all day, you know, drinking beer and watching TV. And well, whatever makes you happy makes you happy. But that's not the way Mendelssohn and the Masculine saw it. They saw there's a real kind of con- content to this happiness, which is really, it kind of goes back to the Aristotelian notion of human flourishing, right? And, you know, in some ways you could see that as there's been a kind of revival of that perspective in a certain way in you have these kind of books on the science of happiness. Well, if happiness is completely subjective, what's the, how could there be a science of happiness? It's just do whatever makes you happy. No, there's a sense that there's certain things which are conducive to human flourishing and certain things were not. And the masculine believe that. And what were those things? Well, those things were developing your different faculties, your intellectual faculty, your aesthetic sensibility, having a healthy body. But the most important component of happiness, they thought, was um, morality, having moral virtue, having moral character. You're actually going to be happier as a person if you have a good moral character. All right. And so what Mendelssohn thought was that, um, you know, there had been a problem within the Jewish community. There was a suspicion of secular studies. There was this kind of rejection of the aesthetic. Um, There was, in traditional Jewish education, there was a sense that, well, it's okay to, you know, coerce people into being Jewish, to, to, to threaten them, to, you know, instill a kind of fear, right? And what Mendelssohn also believes, in addition to those components that I mentioned, that the also, the critical component of happiness is freedom, right? So things must be done from conviction, not out of fear, right? From rational conviction, not out of fear, right? So for Mendelssohn, this kind of reformation of Jewish society was in service of the kind of happiness, the self-development of individual Jews. And at the same time, Mendelssohn believed that Jewish civil rights were also serving that purpose. That if Jews had to, you know, were, you know, couldn't trade freely, if they were always laboring under um, all these kind of restrictions, if they were forced to be under the control of the rabbis who could force them to do what the rabbi said, that actually was undermining um, Jewish happy, you know, happiness, freedom. That was also bad for the European states to be doing that. That was a kind of dark mark on their souls, right? So I really see these two projects as deeply intertwined. And the the connecting point was this notion of self-development that was is captured by the German world word Bildung, which is kind of formation or self-formation. Right. Um, 
absolutely it's just it's interesting because it, it is somewhat jarring if you read the masculine writings which i recommend everyone does the, the, the hebrew at least is extremely beautiful um much of it is actually um critical of, of jews and jewish society it, it's not and and this to be honest this um is taken up later by the zionist movement by others where in order to reform jewish society you have to relentlessly and um, unwaveringly point out the grave flaws that exist in contemporary Jewish society in order to fix them. It's just, it, it's an interesting uh, element of, of masculine writing, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you're right. And here there's kind of different figures, mm -hmm. right? Um, Mendelssohn tends not to be. Right. He certainly doesn't engage really in very much in satiric writing Mendelssohn was far too nice. He was just, you get the feeling he was a nice guy. But, but that's actually the minority of masculine writers. But, but the later writers, certainly they did. Absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, you know, absolutely. So there's this kind of sense that, I mean, this was a kind of adoption of a certain kind of enlightenment, also kind of a mode of writing, you know, you see in Voltaire and others, which is to use kind of sarcasm, point out hypocrisies, as a way of almost, you know, shaming people into, um, you know, into reforming their ways, uh, changing their ways. Um, this was also kind of element of, you know, early modern, um, you know, pre 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 Haskala, you know, Musa writing. You know, which was, you know, there's a lot of uh, of those elements. Absolutely, yeah. Very interesting. Um, so, so we've touched on some uh, elements of of the Haskalah, and uh, as it grew, as you said, uh, began in the Germanic states in uh, in Berlin, and grew out, and eventually uh, crossed into Eastern Europe later in the nineteenth century. But um, I'd like to still focus on this this Germanic element at the beginning, the end of the eighteenth century, uh, and ask the following: To what extent was the Haskalah, as we know it, um, an elite phenomenon? Uh, in other words, it seems, at least from uh, from appearances' sake, that the, the Haskalah was the work of various masculine. In other words, uh, intellectual, uh, um, well-educated, well-read Jews who are writing for each other's benefits and to each other um, in, a, in a kind of language and in journals and in books that it seems that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, not all that many uh, would read. Um, and the question becomes, was this simply a movement among a few dozen intellectuals in Central and Western Europe? Uh, and to what extent did it trickle down into the masses? Uh, were wider and larger communities aware of what was going on? Did they know about uh, these masculine writings. Um, do we know of of anyone not of this intellectual elite involved in this? Were there any women involved in this? Uh, to what extent did this trickle down uh, into the broader society? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, you see, I think the mus the, the the model of the masculine in some ways was the rabbis right. in a certain way. There's a certain way in which, and this is again, uh, Shmuel Feiner emphasizes that it's almost a kind of, they present themselves almost as like an, they're almost like an alternative to the rabbinic elite, right? And, you know, but whereas, especially in Ashkenaz, you know, the rabbinic elite, you know, tended to, um, you know, have its authority either by having a kind of official position recognized by the government or, let's say, by great Talmudic knowledge, uh, you know, the Maskilim were trying to create an alternative set of values that, you know, where, you know, it's not the it's not kind of deep knowledge of all the um, you know subtleties of what they would have called pilpalistic, uh, you know, Talmudics, um, which they harshly criticized, but you know, a grammatical knowledge in Hebrew of the Bible, of the medieval commentators, as well as a kind of secular knowledge, um, and having and above all having this kind of really perfected. Uh, moral character, um, an aesthetic sensibility also, right? So they were almost a kind of like alternative elite to the rabbis, right? And that's also why a lot of the rabbis didn't like them very much. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, yes. Because <laughs> they were competing, right, in some ways. But in the same way that the rabbis is not, you know, even if you're kind of involved in, you know, you have, you know, scholars who, you know, are discussing things, that are, you know, out of the range of, you know, the vast majority of people. But the Maskelem actually rejected that. The Maskelem, because they were part of, there's a, a dimension of Enlightenment philosophy that 
had a bad reputation at the end of the 18th century, but which I think has a lot going for it. And it was known as popular philosophia. And popular philosophy was the idea that philosophy, this kind of guess what we were saying before, in order for it to be a to be a value, it has to affect your life. It can't just be a purely intellectual pursuit. So certain people, you know, thought, well, this is superficial. This is, you know, they're just trying to make these popular philosophers I'm talking right now, you know, who are not necessarily Jewish, right? They're just trying to make philosophy understandable to the masses. They're just trying to speak to the, you know, the majority of people. This isn't, you know, to really be true deep philosophy, it has to be, you know, rely on these subtle distinctions that are, you know, impenetrable. You don't expect the masses to understand, you know, Newton's, you know, uh, Principia, the, the principles of, you know, modern physics. Why should they understand philosophy? But the popular philosophy rejected that. They said, no, if it's just purely theoretical knowledge, who cares? It's supposed to be improving your life. Mendelssohn was part of that group. The masculine were part of that group. So it was very important for them to always try to translate what they were doing and present it in ways that the average person could understand um, and that it could improve their lives. So Mendelssohn's, you know, project, you know, uh, educational project, first of all, if you read his German writings, you know, they're very, he's a wonderful writer, right? In fact, Kant said, oh, I wish Mendelssohn would take what I wrote in the Critique of Pure Reason and, and write it in a way that everyone, that, you know, that'd be more presentable because, you know, originally no one read Kant. <laughs> so it's good to be elite, but if no one reads you, <laughs> everyone recognized he had an incredible style, Mendelssohn. He was a very elegant writer, which is amazing because, you know, German, uh, you know, wasn't his first language. But 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 this is also, you know, so in in, in, in his German writings, but then also in the Biur project, the translation of the Bible into German, you know, he's also trying to reach a um, a broader audience and this was the, you know, the masculine were trying to affect changes. They established a school, I mentioned, which was the first modern school, um, you know, in Germany and in, in German lands and perhaps in Europe, right, that, 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 that Mendelssohn established and, and not, just, not just Mendelssohn, but were involved with it. So on the one hand, they were a certain kind of intellectual elite. Uh, Mendelssohn certainly had a lot of social status. Uh, there were a lot of wealthy people who also were kind of contributing to them, although Mendelssohn had a kind of interesting relation to them. He did. He often said that he identified more with the poor Jews often than some of the wealthy elite. That's where he came from, obviously. Yeah, that's where he came from. And he thought often sometimes there, there were, you know, there were times when their morals could be better, mm -hmm. right? But, um, and that was, you know, the most important thing for him. But, um, but there was obviously it was it was the 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 goal was to become a mass movement and which it did right and the haskalah you could say it was you know the you know the elites the intellectual drivers the financial drivers behind it were a small group of people but it had a mass effect and you could say it really kind of transformed european jewry you know and you could say all of modern jewry in, in a way and certainly by the mid 19th century, if we talk about the German lands, the Maskilic ideals were, you know, even though there was no more Haskalah, but their ideals were certainly accepted by the vast majority of German Jews. Right. So uh, I'd like to get actually onto um, a facet of the Maskilic um, writing endeavors, which I think certainly did spread uh, and did make its way down towards the masses, uh, which is their work on, on the Tanakh and on Bible translation uh, in particular. I know this is a uh, a field of uh, specialization of yours. Um, and so I'd like to ask a sort of more broad question, which is you mentioned before that that part of the Maskilic, let's say, educational or curricular revolution was to recentralize the Tanakh and recentralize the, the, the Hebrew language and also to, to bring the Tanakh back uh, and make it comprehensible, let's say, for, for the average Jew. So what was what happened in the late 18th century uh, in these Germanic lands among the Maskilim? What did they do uh, and how successful were they at, uh, at achieving this? Okay, yeah. So, I mean, there's kind of multiple contexts for understanding this, but, you know, one context is if you look at, you know, traditional Ashkenazic education, uh, which the masculine were extremely critical of. And what they said was, I mentioned this emphasis on Talmud study, almost near exclusive emphasis on, on Talmud study. A little Bible would be studied every week, but it was, you know, uh, almost entirely based on... Uh, 
based on Talmud study, four boys, right? And from a very young age. And what the Maskili Mendelssohn, his his um, contemporary Wesley, who was you know one of the most important Maskili, they said, well, you know, this is an extremely problematic model. What's what is this about? Really, you 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 know, he says the teacher would, you know, you they would basically hire private teachers, tutors. And they would be teaching these boys, um, you know, Talmud from age five, six, seven. Um, and he says they didn't really understand what they were talking about. They're, stud- they're studying, you know, all sorts of things about marriage and, you know, and divorce. And they don't, they have no idea what this is about, right? Um, and he says, well, what was the purpose of this? Well, and then he says the teacher was paid by the parents. So the teacher was incentivized to always say, oh, your, your son is doing so well. And the thing was, there was a social cachet to it, because if you had this knowledge, then you were part of the rabbinic elite. You were a Talmud Chacham or an aspiring Talmud Chacham, and you could get a good marriage, and you could get supported by your in-laws. And But what, what were the kids really coming out with, right? They weren't really coming out with much. Uh, it wasn't improving them. And maybe there were a few people, a, a very, very few young children that could do this, but 99% of the kids weren't were really, you know, maybe they had a respect for this knowledge. Uh, maybe that's what it instilled in them, a respect for the Talmud Chachami, but they weren't really getting much out of it themselves. So, you know, so that's kind of like one context. And the other context is, um, you know, the Bible. And, you know, in the medieval period, uh, obviously the Bible was very important. <laughs> right? Clearly, you know, Rashi, all the commentators, right? Uh, certainly the Spanish commentators. Um, but what happened was with the rise of Protestantism and Luther's emphasis on the Bible, um, but that led many Jews in Ashkenazic lands, and, Ger- and Luther was obviously German, to turn away from the Bible, right? And to say, well, you know, this is not a distinguishing Jewish text because, you know, the, uh, the Protestants are reading this. Remember, of course, the Catholics before Luther, Christians didn't really read the Bible much. Right, and they were the old uh, Latin translation of the Vulgate. No one could understand, uh, except for you know certain priests. In and, fact, you could be you could you know, be burnt at the stake for translating it into the vernacular. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, 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 so the Bible was, you know, as far as Jews were concerned, this was kind of safe territory. This is our book. The Christians don't even really study this. But this became problematic after after the Reformation. And at least according to the way this narrative goes that the masculine told, right, this is when this real emphasis on the Talmud and exclusion of the Bible really occurred. And they said, well, there's no real reason to turn away from the Bible. The Bible is a very important work because the Bible, unlike the Talmud, which, you know, really contains these, um, you know, it's the vast majority of it is these legal disputes. Uh, then there's some stories, some very nice, interesting stories, but it doesn't really provide a kind of overall picture of the place of the Jews in history, in the world, right? And and if the importance of the basis of Jewish practice is supposed to be conviction, Jews have to have, to have a better understanding of their mission and of their place in history and the relationship to, you know, the non-Jewish world, you know, and the Bible, the first, you know, whatever, whatever, what it is, 12 chapters or whatever it is, doesn't mention Jews, doesn't mention anything specifically, specific to Jews, right? So the, the, so the Bible was seen to be this like very important document in instilling a kind of sense of, of, um, you know, of conviction of what it meant to be Jewish. Of course, the masculine wants to read the Bible through a Jewish lens, right? They, they're, relied on the medieval Jewish commentators. They took issue with Christian readings of it. Um, But um, the Bible, on the one hand, was a kind of common heritage with the Christians, but they felt it was important to read it through, uh, specifically through a Jewish lens to to gain a kind of understanding. So before Mendelssohn, there were no translations of the Bible into German, Jewish translations of the Bible into German. Uh, Mendelssohn was the first. And after that, this became a huge cottage industry uh, where you have over 20 different translations of the Bible that Jews produced in the next century and a half, which was even more than Protestants produced, even though Jews were only 1% of the population. So the Bible becomes to be a, a central vehicle for instilling a Jewish sense of um, mission, of um, ethics, cultivation, self-cultivation, right? Because the Bible is also what 
what the masculine emphasizes is its beautiful aesthetic qualities. You can actually gain an aesthetic appreciation by understand by studying biblical poetry. And so, and by studying the language of Hebrew. So the masculine emphasized all these dimensions. They felt that the Bible was an essential component in this Jewish self-formation, in this kind of bildung that I mentioned. Fascinating. And um, and these, the Bible, I mean, you referenced a little bit the, the Bible translation and commentary that Mendelssohn was a sort of editor of, but uh, but had contributions from, from many others. Can you perhaps elaborate slightly on the Bior? Because I think this is an intellectual keystone of of this whole endeavor. Yeah, absolutely. So the Biur, and I mean, talk about successful. I mean, the Biur went to something like 27 different editions. I'm not talking about reprints. And it spread from Germany throughout Eastern Europe. So this was a kind of great Jewish bestseller. And this is, um, and this was, you know, used in schools. And so the Biur was, Mendelssohn said originally, he, you know, composed it for his son. This is a legend. This was, you know, Maybe that was part of it, but that wasn't. Obviously, he had the intention of uh, disseminating it to a wider audience because he said at one point, <laughs> he says in a letter, maybe this is a bit of sarcasm. I don't know if it was, but he says, you know, originally I thought it was just for my son, but then I realized, well, many even, you know, rabbinic figures could use it. <laughs> right. So that might have been a little bit. Um, but, you know, but basically what he was saying is that, you know, so so it contains a, a translation of the Bible into into German in Hebrew characters. So it looked like Yiddish, but it was German. And then the commentary was in Hebrew. And Mendelssohn himself produced the commentary on Genesis, the uh, on, on the first Parsha of Genesis, Bereshit, and on all of Exodus. And then he kind of really revised and really edited and really kind of authored the commentary on um, Deuteronomy. Although that one's kind of shorter, and the other ones were com- produced by his um, by his um, friends and associates, uh, most notably uh, Naftali Hertz Wesley, um, who in the nineteenth century, in the eighteenth century, was a very considered a very kind of problematic figure. Uh, he was famously, you know, attacked for his proposal of educational reforms by the No Dibi Huda, but in the nineteenth century, he kind of gained re-entry into orthodoxy um, and he was kind of accepted by the neo-orthodox and I actually recently saw there's a kind of new edition of his works of the works of Rav Naftali Hertz Vesli uh, Zecher Tzadik Livracha that has come out in Israel uh, that they've gone back to his manuscript and reprinted it so he's had this kind of like well it already in the 19th century began this kind of real revival of kind of acceptance back into traditionalist Judaism um, whereas it's interesting that in the 18th century, he was much more controversial. Mendelssohn was actually more accepted, but in the 19th century, it reversed, and Mendelssohn became much more problematic because, I think, because he became the symbol. Exactly, yeah. because he became the, the figurehead. Um, it's funny growing up in in uh, more Haredi circles, the the things you hear about Mendelssohn would make one's hair stand on end, and then you actually read a book about him, and uh, well, the, the, it's entirely the opposite. Um, so this would be a good segue to move into. Uh, Another very important part of this whole story, which is, of course, the counter Haskalah, the anti Haskalah, the the opposition to um, uh, what was going on in those cities in Germany and, and elsewhere in Western Europe. Um, could, could you speak a little bit to that? I mean, what was, uh, as you said before, there was obviously an adverse rabbinic reaction. Um, in what what was, what was the shape? What was the narrative of that? Um, and to what degree were they successful in pushing back uh, on the Haskalah? Yeah, so that I mean that that's a really great question. Um, so I, I think that kind of the first level of opposition actually begins in Mendelssohn's own time, but less again towards Mendelssohn, more towards Wesley, because Wesley, you know, writes this book Divrei Shalom Vemet, this pamphlet which really advocates this uh, educational reforms within the Jewish community, um, and he emphasizes, you know, that. You know, there has to be this kind of complementarity between what he called, you know, Chochma Ha'adam, which is this kind of universal knowledge, uh, which includes geography and all sorts of sciences, uh, as well as universal morality, and then Judaism, which was, um, you know, Chochma Tashem. Um, and he, um, oh, sorry, Torah Tashem, Torah Tashem and Torah Ta'adam. Um, and so, but, but, but Wesley also, he was, again, he was, it's funny because he was much more in some ways bold 
um, in his kind of criticism of the rabbis. Initially, he he wrote, you know, he was a great grammarian, and he was actually very extremely respected as a as a grammarian, and he has a whole theory of Hebrew synonyms um, that he wrote in the 1750s, I believe, and he had a, a rabbinic approbation, a haskama from the Noda Yehuda, uh, from Rav Yechazkel Landa, who's one of the leading traditionalists of the time. But after he published uh, this call for educational reform, uh, he was very harshly attacked by various rabbis, including by um, the No W. Huda. And, you know, essentially the argument was, well, there's a lot of different arguments. It's actually quite an interesting sermon he gave. It's called the, the, the Sermon on Shabbat HaGadol. And it's actually kind of fascinating, uh, fascinating document. Uh, but he kind of accuses Wesley of um, being a kind of sycophant. Because part of Wesley's reforms were prompted by there was this, you know, kind of pressure from the um, the, the government, especially in Austria, and so 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 he's he kind of accuses Wesley of being a kind of sycophant, and he's just trying to appease the secular authorities. And I think this becomes a very important part of the um, counter narrative. It's is that the Maskilim are kind of sellouts that they're just doing this to gain approval in the eyes of the Goyim. They're just doing this. They don't really have any firm convictions. They just want these um, material advancement. They want to appease the authorities so they can get more honor, respect, money, uh, you know, wealth. Sort of, that's what's really kind of driving this. So there's this kind of reductive <laughs> view of what the masculine were doing, but it kind of, you know, you know, and you could see why they're making this argument. There is these, there are these governmental pressures, but that's certainly not the way the, the masculine saw themselves. So that becomes, I think, part of, um, you know, an important part of the counter narrative and this great ire and great, um, you know, anger that's kind of poured out towards them. And I think that's the kind of first level. But this is ultimately not very successful. Right. <laughs> in, you know, ultimately, this, this, the, the rabbinic counterattack in the 18th century is a complete failure. Um, uh, you know, and so what happens is in the 19th century, Haskalah and then, you know, successors, reform Judaism, um, you know, kind of begins, you know, is greatly advancing. And then you have uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch, who you know arises, and you know he's he has these kind of conservative masculic roots, connection to uh, Mendelssohn to Wesley, um, but he he also is very concerned about the direction that um, that Haskalah will, and what ultimately becomes Reform is going, and that's really kind of leading to the abandonment of Jewish tradition, and you know he develops a whole different type of counter argument which is, um, on the one hand, adopting many of the muscular principles. Yes, of course, this kind of universal concern for humanity, that's a critical part of Judaism. Judaism is ultimately about morality. But the how one attains this is through a precise um, fulfillment of all the laws of the Torah. And, and in the 19th century, you have developed a bit of a kind of historical understanding of the Bible, the beginning of kind of biblical criticism, a, you know, a kind of historical contextualization of rabbinic writings, especially, that which doesn't really exist in the, with Mendelssohn and the Maskelim in the 18th century, and Hirsch completely rejects that. So he kind of tries to set a new foundation for this kind of counterattack by in some ways adopting elements of um, the masculine principles that he accepts, that he thinks are true, are right. This whole idea of building self-cultivation, absolutely. But from what Hirsch says is that it's that's not the highest ideal. That is the building is in service of fulfillment of the Torah, right? It helps you fulfill the Torah in a deeper way. If you have true understanding of the purpose of the, of the Torah, of, of the reasons for the Torah, not the truth, the, as far as you understand it, if you do it out of conviction, it's better service of God. If you have an aesthetic appreciation of literature, that will help you understand the Torah, the Bible. So he kind of, um, the way I read it is, he kind of uh, 
runs with those ideas and but sets them on this new basis um which involves rejecting a kind of historical reading of um, of Jewish tradition. So, so this is fascinating. And um, so you you see, or, or as you presented it, um, the Haskalah, or the counter-reaction to the Haskalah, enables or fuels the rise of what is nowadays called neo-orthodoxy as spearheaded by Hirsch, and then, uh, you know, which morphs into various kinds of modern orthodoxies, as we see today in, the, in uh, Western Europe and United States. Um, but I wanted to, to focus in for a moment on the connections between uh, Haskalah and the reform movement. The reform movement also arises in Germany uh, shall we say 1830s, 1840s, it really started to, to blossom um, and became very powerful and eventually ended up taking over the Jewish communities in Central and Western Europe. More Jews uh, you know, became uh, or identified with various kinds of reform uh, synagogues. And the question becomes, to what extent was the uh, was the Mahaskala a forerunner to this? In other words, can one, and this is, as you say, a common trope in, let's say, uh, more religious circles even till today, which is to say, ah, the Haskala, that's that led directly to the reform. The reform movement was simply the logical conclusion of the, the Haskalah movement. Um, to what extent is this correct? Can one draw a direct line of causation from one to the other? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, l- let me address that. I'll just, I just want to say one other thing, sure. and then I'll answer that question. So it's not only neo-Orthodoxy, right? For instance, you could also see Musar movement as having deep debts to the Haskalah, this emphasis on this kind of moral refinement, refinement of character, right? And in fact, um, this is actually a new project that I'm working on, uh, on Musar, is that, you know, the Maskilim themselves developed books of Musar, right? Because they, they developed this idea, well, if, if the really important question is how do we connect the heart and the, and the, and the mind? Well, we need practical tools to do so. Musar literature, they said, is a great resource for us. And they created their own works of Musar. And one of the most important works of Musar that was created by a Amaska, who was very close to Moses Mendelssohn, is uh, the book Cheshbon Nefesh by uh, Mendel Leffen of Satinau. And this book was a favorite of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. And he republished the book. And it became a very important component of the, 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 the modern Musar movement. So there's also a deep connection between Haskalah and the Musa movement. But let's go back to the question of reform. Because before, I think before we do, can, can I ask very quickly, do the Musa leaders acknowledge the debt they have? No. no. That's what I thought. Okay, good. <laughs> no. Well, uh, this, is, uh, this is what I'm doing. I mean, this is very interesting. There's, a, there's a, you know, an addition. Of, there's one translation. It's a fascinating book, Cheshbon Nefesh. Everyone should read this book. It's, it's an amazing book. There's one tra- English translation of it, and, and, and there's one translation of it into English. It uh, was by Shragas, I think Silverstein originally did it, who translated the Masil Yasharim, and it's through the Feldheim Torah Classics edition. It's just been republished, uh, reissued. Uh, it's actually a very good translation, and it has, a trans- it has a, uh, an introduction from... Um, from I forget, it's like the Saba of Slobodka or something who like who, who wrote a preface to it, right? So this book, but it, but it never mentions that he was a maskil, right? Of course not. Um, so so so, but but that's but that is kind of one line. But I think the thing the thing about the Haskalah we have to understand is that it's not one thing or another. Reform is another line out of the Haskalah, no doubt. It's not it's not that oh the reform just have. You know, there's no connection between reform and Haskalah. Of course, there's also a deep connection between reform and Haskalah. And it is a kind of certain line of development out of Haskalah, emphasizing putting morality at the center of Judaism, stressing the universal dimensions of Judaism. Um, Where reform kind of takes it in, you know, kind of goes further, I think, is where it kind of begins to, um, it kind of rejects the Mendelssohnian, the moderate Maskilic perspective that, well, we have this divine revelation, which is kind of ahistorical, and so the law is binding no matter what. And reform introduces a historical sensibility, and it says, no, we have to see, you know, the Bible, rabbinic writings as developing in history. And in fact, we have to, that's the way we have to understand what rabbinic sects are doing. They're essentially revising the Bible. Right, Mendelssohn never thought that. Right, but th- this is what he. Th- this is what they, th- they they developed through a kind of 
because the historical consciousness begins to become much more important in the 19th century. And once you add that element to it, then you can certainly take the step and say, well, we need to continue revising, updating, rejecting what doesn't really kind of serve um, our purposes. So one way of understanding the difference between neo-orthodoxy and reform is that neo-orthodoxy, they both think that the Torah, you know, kind of creates an ethical person, creates a kind of fully developed, actualized person, or can. But what orthodoxy says is that, well, we have confidence that it does because it was revealed by God. Whereas what reform says is that, well, this is a kind of process. The essence of Judaism is aiming toward that, but maybe it doesn't always do that in every area, or maybe we have to update it because we have new, new circumstances, and we, we, we could discard things that are no longer relevant for us today. Um, so yeah, so I think you have to see, the way I would see it is not that there's one movement that comes from Haskalah and the other one's a distortion. There's many different directions that come out of Haskalah, depending on changing circumstance. You know, new... So I was going to say, in which case, allow me to sharpen my question. Okay. Um, because, because this is the, because you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it would be impossible to say that the reform movement is, has nothing to do with the Haskalah. There obviously is a line of causation. But then the question becomes as follows, because this is the main critique, I think, leveled by the more staunchly orthodox world, which is that the Maskilim were in a way very naive in the sense that they didn't realize that if you, at least the moderate Maskilim, that if you would open the door to critical inquiry, to a kind of ethical-based view of religion, um, then obviously this would end in a rejection of, of orthodox dogma and orthodox tenets. In other words, they'd say that, that, that reform was inevitable even if the Maskilim didn't want to admit it. That, but they were opening a door through which Reform, the, the the wide scale reform and, and let's say rejection of previous um, widely held axioms of Judaism was inevitable. I mean, do you think there's validity to this critique? I mean, why? Why would it inevit? Unless you believe that Judaism is fundamentally a religion that's you know parochial, a religion that's grounded in coercion. That's grad that involves a certain kind of either neglect or hate of the non-Jewish world. Unless you, if you think that's authentic Judaism, then yes. <laughs> but if you don't believe that, and certainly Hirsch didn't believe that, certainly you know, I don't think Rabbi Israel Salanter believed that. Uh, certainly, Rav Cook didn't believe that. Then uh, there's, I don't think, you, there's no reason to think that you're inevitably going to come to a rejection of Judaism. Right. Fair enough. Um, okay, I, I, I hear that. It, it, it's just that um, I, that that would that is generally the line that is drawn. That is that, that they say. You know, um, the Haskalah may have started with the sort of good intentions that they proclaimed, but actually, you know, there was only one way this could have gone. Uh, but but yes. Well, it's also a kind of. I think there's also a certain kind of interesting question about human nature here. You know, because right. you know what Mendelssohn believed and what Hirsch believes. Mm -hmm. you know, is that you can partake in, no, there's these wonderful things in non-Jewish culture, right? There's these wonderful writings and teachings and, you know, uplifting art and, you know, beautiful humanitarian ideas. Um, and that can really enrich your appreciation of Torah and allow you to understand it even on a deeper level. Then there's a lot of really negative things. There's a lot of things, you know, arousing, you know, Hirsch talked about the arousing of sensual desire, greed, avarice, which is often, you know, which is often lauded, which is often valorized, right? We think the great people, people who are, you know, a certain kind of greed, we don't call it greed, but we call it ambition or something like that. But, you know, right. but then there's all sorts of, you know, you know, se you know, sexually problematic, you know, you know, depictions of all sorts of relationships that are really very unwholesome and romanticized or a certain view of, you know, romantic love as, you know, and a certain kind of passion as the, the true love, you know, which is a really kind of problematic view for, you know, um, you know, for someone like a Hirsch or, or, or a Mendelssohn. But uh, so, you know, I think what the Mas the early masculine and you know and what her said, so look you have to have a very selective attitude towards these things i think maybe what the more you know staunchly as you're calling staunchly orthodox 
The fear is, well, it's very hard to distinguish those two different things. There's too many dangers here because, yes, there are these, you know, if you press the, if you press the person, you say, yes, there are some very good things that you can find in secular culture, but it's too dangerous because it's too mixed with different things and people are not going to be able to distinguish between those two. And the net impact is going to be too negative. And that's an interesting argument to have. I agree. It, it, this brings you to the, the last question I think we have time for today. Um, and I'd like to, I'd fr I'll frame this as follows, which is that um, a few years ago, Stephen Pinker, a professor of psychology at Harvard and a popular science writer, he wrote a book called Enlightenment Now, right? Which is basically an argument. I think the subtitle was an, an argument for reason, science, and, and whatever. Um, and his argument of the book essentially was that the Enlightenment project isn't over. Right, that uh, enlightenment is something we must still strive for, uh, something which which you know we must still view as an ideal, and therefore we must uh, you know uh, uphold and defend reason and and rationality, and reject all sorts of uh, you know bad thinking and uh, and you know and, and foolishness and, and superstitions of various sorts. Um, but the, the essential claims of the enlightenment isn't over, and and sort of I wanted to Jewify this question and, and put it to you, which is that um, does the Haskalah have an end date where you can say ah you know. Haskalah as a project is now over, and now we have lots of other things that have taken it over. Or would you say that actually Haskalah has continued, and the ideal of Haskalah and the ethos of it has continued till this day, and it remains, at least for some, a, some kind of imperative or some kind of ideal that they still hold to and, and ought to hold to? Where, where would you fall on, on that spectrum? Well, for obviously, yeah, certainly as a movement, you know, Haskalah in German lands ends by about 1800, a little bit later. In Central and Eastern Europe, it lasts, you know, maybe into the 1860s. Um, so as a movement, obviously, Haskalah is dead by the 1860s, and people don't call themselves Maskelim anymore. But I think in many of the, you know, modern versions of Judaism, Reform, New Orthodoxy, Positive Historical, um, even in a certain way, Zionism, um, Musar, you know, you have these these ideals which are kind of continue to permeate and continue to have influence. And in a certain sense, they have a, a you know a great influence uh, till today. And they really kind of shape the thinking of you know I still think of, of of many people, even if people aren't really conscious that it's connected to the Haskalah, or maybe they don't even have a clear understanding of what these ideas are um, and what these kind of principles are. Um, but they there's a sort of inchoate you know inheritance of them. Um, at the same time, I think that it's not as if you could say Haskalah is irrelevant because, you know, it's conquered all minds or something like that. I think there is still this kind of debate and tension about some of these principles, um, about the pace, place of Judaism in the world, the relationship between, you know, Jews and non-Jews, the question of Jewish superiority. These kind of like questions, I think, as we see, are still you know, still very much debated, um, you know, still coming out, you know, in certain, you know, you know, elements in Zionism and stuff like that. So I don't think that it's, that Haskalah has kind of won the day. Um, I think that, I think it has and continues to have a very important effect, but it is still in some sense debated, you know, contested, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I agree with you in general. It's. Um, I, I would. I would just add a lament that um, the forces of anti Haskala seems to uh, seem to grow greater and greater in many ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Know, yeah. Perhaps that. Uh, yeah. That's a subject for another for another conversation. Um, Professor Gottlieb, I'm very grateful uh, that you came on the podcast of Jewish Ideas. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. Um, thank you very much for engaging with us in this conversation. And we hope to have you back on at some point uh, to discuss further. Right. Thank you very much for joining us. It was us. a pleasure being here. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. This has been the podcast of Jewish Ideas by Torah in Motion, produced by Alicia Kelman and myself, JJ Kimchi, edited and mixed by Alicia Kelman. You can stay up to date by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. To support more thoughtful Jewish content like this, please visit torahinmotion.org slash donate.